my name is Lena Rachel Anderson. I uh, am so happy to see all of you here at the European Bildung Network fireside chat about the exponential technologies and um, what kind of building we need in order to handle them as individuals and as societies. And uh, we have three wonderful guests tonight. We have uh, Panilla Tranberg, and we have Asim Azar, and we have uh, Anders Wiegmann. But before we start, uh, I would like to welcome everybody with a, uh, with a toast. Uh, it's a Thursday evening, and um, I think we uh, deserve a, a nice evening, and so welcome. And uh, I hope we get a, a good evening. <clears throat> and, uh, and that being said, um, those of you who are on Zoom uh, can turn off your camera now and uh, then you'll have the chat room, the, the chat track on the right hand side of your screen and you can write questions or comments there. And we will have Esli who will um, We'll keep an eye on it and bring in the, the questions later. So welcome, and I would like to turn to our three guests. And uh, I would, would like you to introduce yourselves because I think you're much better at it than uh, I would be. And uh, we were supposed to have Hans Schnitzel here tonight. As you can tell, we have a, a woman in the panel that was uh, uh, not planned until uh, Tuesday evening. So I would like Penela to, uh, to introduce, her, introduce herself first, please. Okay, um, yeah, I'm a former journalist actually, and today, the past 10 years, I've been working with privacy and data ethics in uh, two ways. Uh, privacy or digital self-defense, as I call it, is um, where I do, where I teach uh, children, school teachers, uh, companies, um, unions in data understanding and digital self-defense. Uh, and that means that how to take control of your own data and your own reputation and digital identity online. And then I work with data ethics, which is uh, trying to help or make organizations and companies much more responsible in the way they use personal data and also try and turn that into a competitive advantage. We are not there yet, but we'll be there. <laughs> Ethical behavior is the new uh, competitive ad advantage. Um, Azim, please. Thank you so much. It's uh, wonderful to uh, to be here. Uh, so my name is Azim Azar, and I don't think I've changed that much because what I do now uh, is almost where I was born and how I was born. So I was born in 1972, just a year after the Intel 4004 processor was launched, uh, and that uh, processor was really at the heart of Moore's law, which is one of the exponential tech, uh, the, the processes that is a <coughs> technology wave. Uh, I'm just gonna ask uh, Margareta Palmquist to turn off a camera, please. There you go, thank you. Okay, good. Uh, and, uh, but equally, I was born in, uh, in Zambia where my parents were working in the field of uh, economic development. And here I am 48 years later and my work, uh, is after having been a technology investor and a founder uh, and also a journalist some 20 years ago, my work looks at the new political economy that is emerging as a consequence of exponential technologies. Uh, and to circle back round, I was born just at the start of the microprocessor revolution, which is a critical exponential technology uh, in a family that was worrying about uh, issues like political institutions uh, and the development uh, of the economy. So nothing has really changed. <laughs> but uh, could you, yeah, nothing new under the sun, yeah. uh, except a few t exponential technologies. <laughs> could you say just a few words about your, um, your exponential review? Yes. So uh, for the last five years, I've been trying to put this thesis out and work it out, work out what I mean by the new political economy of exponential technologies through a newsletter and a podcast that's called Exponential view. Uh, you can find it at exponentialview.co. Uh, and in it, what I try to do there is identify from the bottom up the technologies that are uh, fall into this category, but also look at the critical questions that are the humanistic dimensions of the technology. Uh, so things that Pernil obviously knows a lot about, like privacy and 
control and agency, but also things like business models and industry structure and governance. Thank you. Anders, please. Well, I'm a bit older than uh, Asim. <clears throat> Uh, I was, in fact, born in the 1940s, so, so my perspective is a bit longer. Um, but it's interesting uh, because in 1979-80, I was chairing the first, I believe, task force in Sweden uh, looking into privacy-related uh, issues in the wake of the digitization of society. So I, I had quite uh, a number of years when I was very much engaged in uh, privacy and integrity issues. Then later on, I uh, joined the, the Red Cross um, and worked with humanitarian work for many years, um, some research capacity building, United Nations, and then I became a member of the European Parliament. So I have some experience from politics um, and if there is a red thread in my life, it's, it's about uh, the tension between our economies and nature. Uh, so sustainability in all its aspects has been uh, my guiding principle. Um, and I'm fascinated by these new technologies. And by the way, a couple of years ago, I, I just happened to, um, to uh, know about Asim Asar's uh, newsletter every Sunday. And uh, since that time, I've been spending a lot of hours reading your stuff, Asim, and with, with, with great appreciation, great appreciation. Thank, Thank you, Anders. And you were the co-president of? The Club of Rome, yeah. Right, so, um, so thank you. Uh, exponential technologies um, is, is kind of a, I mean, it doesn't really say what the technologies are about. Um, so maybe we should explain what what do we mean by exponential technologies? And and since Asim, you have an entire website about this. So what what is the what is the point here, and why why is this crucial? Yeah, thank you. So the way I I define um, exponential technologies are technologies which improve at uh, a very fast rate. We call them exponential uh, every year. Um, the the number I choose and people can choose different numbers, is a 10% or higher annualized improvement in the performance of the technology for the same amount of money. And if you think about historically, you put money in your bank account and <coughs> you get a 2% rate of interest. No one gets that these days, of course, and it compounds over many years. It grows much faster. Uh, but in, in an, with an exponential technology, the rate of growth is so significant that it is hard for us to psychologically understand the, the rate with which it's, it, it's moved. I mean, if you take silicon chips, uh, they have typically improved at the rate of 50 to 60% in terms of performance every single year, which means that the computer that lives inside my iPhone has got more processing power than the, any the processing power of the most powerful supercomputers from the late 1980s, the computers that governments used to model nuclear weapons, that meteorological agencies used to model the weather. And yet many of us have phones as powerful as this that we no longer use that sit in our, our desk drawers. So an exponential technology is one that improves at these double digit rates on a compounding basis for years and years and years. And, and for a reasonable amount of time, um, in, up until perhaps 20 or 30 years ago, the only one we really thought about was silicon chips that had created all of this value in the technology industry. Uh, but since then, we've identified that there are other technologies that are improving at those rates or even faster. So slightly lower, slower than silicon chips, we're seeing in, in energy, in terms of renewable energy generation and in terms of battery storage, slightly faster than silicon chips, we're seeing in the field of genomics, that is synthetic biology, our ability to tinker with the stuff of life. Um, and at about the same sort of rate, we're seeing it in manufacturing technologies like 3D printing. Now, now the, the thing to think about, just the, the two things to hold on to, the first is that if you think that the computer on its own in the last 45 years, 50 years, since the first Intel chip has transformed our world 
uh, not just in, in terms of the politics, in terms of the, the, the wealth, in terms of how our industries are structured, um, that process is not slowing down. If anything, it's getting faster, but that rate of change is happening in many other industries. So I, I look at exponential technologies with this, this definition, which is a double digit rate of change uh, that can be compounded over many, many years. Um, and the thing that's interesting, I mean, the technologies are interesting in a science fiction standpoint. What's really interesting is how does it impact the world in which we live and how can we shape that world given these very disruptive technologies. Right, and you said the word disruptive. I, I just wonder if, if Anders or Panilla has anything to add to this description of, of these technologies and why we call it exponential. Oh, I would love to ask a question about- um, Please do. Asim, uh, what, what do you, uh, how do you connect with uh, um, Singularity University? Because uh, when you say exponential, that's my first association. And I just want to hear what is your relation to them, just so I know. <laughs> oh, I mean, I know a number of people from, uh, from Singularity and we've, you know, I've, I've collaborated with uh, individuals from Singularity in the past. Yeah. So, but, but are, are you agreeing with them when they, are you on the, in, on the same line as them? I will read your newsletter from now on, I promise. <laughs> um, I, I think they did a great job in helping us understand the potential of thinking about um, incredibly difficult problems that, uh, that we, we didn't think we could solve and new technologies created these amazing potentials. Um, but I think it's very important uh, th that we understand three, three things about technologies. The first is that uh, what's interesting about the technologies is the impact it has on our, our lives. And fundamentally that rotates around power. So it is a political question. The, the second thing I think that's really important to understand is that um, these technologies are not predestined, predetermined, the shape of them, the way in which they, they land in our world is not predestined. You, you can use the power of fire for good and for evil. You can use a hammer for good and for evil. You can choose not to design a hammer. And so there is an opportunity, there is an importance to understand that there is not a deterministic cast about this. And I think the third thing that I think is really important is that um, humans, made tools and tools made humans, to quote Melvin Kranzberg, the American historian. Um, and so there, there has been a belief in the technology industry over the last 40 or 50 years that only a certain type of person can make the technology and therefore only a certain type of person is entitled to determine what the impacts of that technology should be. And, and what that's done over the last 45 years 50 years is that it has disempowered us to participate in the conversation about these technologies that ultimately govern our lives. So in the sense, even though things like the internet are fundamentally ha have at their heart an opportunity to democratize the world, the process by which technology has been created has been rather undemocratic and more reminiscent of the high priests who hide their secrets from an unknowing public in the ancient times. And, and here we are, the uh, unknowing public with, <laughs> with uh, three experts in, in the field. I would just like to uh, explain to those of our, our viewers who do not know what uh, Singularity University is. Um, Asim, I'll just let you uh, spend five words on that. Um, I mean, Singularity University is, a, is an amazing group of people who came together in Silicon Valley perhaps 20 years ago to help explore, help people understand the power of uh, exponential technologies and the radical nature in which they, 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 they change and they shift. Um, and, and it may be worth us talking about some of the psychological biases that live around trying to understand exponential processes. Um, the founders 
um, are phenomenal scientists. And the idea of the singularity in the word singularity university is this notion that uh, computers will get so powerful so quickly because they essentially double in power every year or two, every two to three years really, that at some point they will surpass the capacities of the human. And that will become the singularity where we have to become one with the machines. Right. So the singularity is a point in time or in human history where something so different will happen that human life will be different afterwards. It's a, it's a particular difference, though. It's the particular difference is the, the capacity of the I mean, the capacity of the machines to um, envelop us in a sense. Um, but we are not there yet. We're not there yet. Right. No. Swan, could you uh, turn off your camera, please? There you go. Thanks. Uh, Anos, yes, please. Thanks heaven, we are not there yet. Um, and and Asim, you said that there are three things that are very distinctive about these technologies. They are, and one of them was that they are not predestined. Mm. They can be used for good. They can be used for evil. My problem, having been in, a politician for quite some time in my life, is that I know that most policymakers don't know very much about this. I, I would even even be so drastic to say they don't they don't know a shit about it. <laughs> Which means that <clears throat> we have a very, very fast technology development uh, offering enormous opportunities in many areas. And we can start talking about them. Um, just look at the internet, the smartphone, what it has brought to us. I mean, it's it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. But we also have a number of risks which are related to the application of these technologies that relate to power, that relate to governance and democracy, that relate to competition, that relate to jobs markets, that to relate to this human <clears throat> machine interface and the whole issue, who are we as humans? Um, and uh, lethal autonomous weapons, just to mention a few. <laughs> and the problem is, the problem is that we have very little discussion about this in society. And the irony is that some of the leading scientists came together some years ago um, and adopted a, a very, very fine statement called, um, I never forget, I always uh, the Asilomar principles, That's right. which, which deals with the ethics. But I can tell you, I, if I went to the Swedish parliament or European parliament, or particularly the US Congress, if I refer to these principles, I doubt that more than a handful would know about them. See, I, I have never heard about it. And I invited the three of you. So yeah. um, <clears throat> can, can you mention some of the principles in, in there? Or maybe... Uh... Well, uh, um, well, they say uh, one of them is that we, are, we should create what they say... Uh, intelligence in the machine area that is, is beneficial. We should, um, uh, AI, AI system should be designed compatible with human rights, dignity, and cultural diversity. Uh, people, write, uh, people have a right to control their own data. Prosperity um, that is uh, uh, developing from all this technology should be shared. We should avoid an arms race with autonomous weapons, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there are some very, very fine principles. But the problem is these are not discussed. And the, 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 the political system, if at all, is reactive, not proactive. And I think this is, this is scary because, as Asim just said, developments are so fast. Um, and I've been concerned about this now for five, six years. And... and, and uh, I simply don't know what to do about it, but education and building is part of the answer, no doubt. Mm. So I don't want to be sound like um, um, like somebody who a luddite who, <laughs> who doesn't embrace technology. On the contrary, and I see that in my particular field, sustainability, some of these disruptive technologies will help us a lot, a lot, and are already helping us. Mm. But I also see the risk that 
developments in overall may, may be very harmful and may change society in a way that, that I don't think we want, would like to see. So we have to, we have to um, get on top of this. Yes, I see. Just stand up for the Luddites uh, for a second, for a moment, because um, I think the Luddites understood um, the core problem here. The problem was not technology, the problem was the power. So the mm -hmm. introduction of new machinery in the 19th, 18th and 19th century um, meant that, uh, and it's, it was remarkable, but it was not exponential. You saw a nine, then 27, then 35 fold improvement in the output of these machines producing various types of, of textiles over the trained human. And one consequence was that uh, obviously a, a lot of people were going to be required to service the, service the machines for their input and deal with the output, but a number of people were going to find their skills diminish in value. And a large part of the argument from the Luddites was, we want to participate in the discussion around how the gains of this new productivity should be shared. Mm angry when they were told well we're not going to share them with you <laughs> we are the capitalists we're going to take them all and that we're not we're not going to share those gains um and i, and I do see a similar process playing out now and I, I think it's interesting that you know you have singularity all the way out here and you have um the asilomar principles which anders has raised but we also have a very very present issues that creep in on us slowly, one moment at a time, which I think are the types of things that Pernil is, is fighting, right? The, the creeping invasion of privacy, which starts with us not really minding and ends up with us being very, very uh, on the wrong, wrong side of a power dynamic that's unhelpful. So one of the, one of the things that I mean, right now we're in this COVID uh, lockdown or degrees, different degrees of, of lockdown, depending on where we are. And as I was bicycling through Copenhagen this afternoon, I was, I was, I just sensed this kind of different, you know, awareness of, I mean, other people have suddenly become potential uh, spreaders of a deadly virus. And, and so we keep a distance and we've changed our manners and we've changed our, you know, hand washing and all that stuff. There are all these little things that, of course, we adjust to this. Um, and then I, I had this sort of, what, what would it be like if the next thing that was sort of released upon us was surveillance drones, for instance? How would that change our behavior if we knew that, I mean, so there are cameras everywhere um, and in some cities, they're already everywhere already. But what would it, and, and we don't notice them, but what would it feel like if we could hear the drones all the time? I've been to, you know, um, huge uh, events of, uh, where, where the police have drones uh, flying above the event to, you know, make sure there isn't a terror attack or something. But what would it feel like if every time we went outside, we were reminded that there was some, something hovering over us mm. and, you know, keeping an eye on where we were going and who we were meeting with. So, so I think this, um, and with the exponential technology, it's, it's the, the pace, I mean, suddenly it takes off. And, and I think that is also why it's, it's so important to, ex to understand this exponentiality that for a long time, it's just, you know, looks like if nothing is happening and then boom, suddenly uh, major things change simultaneously. And, I, and, and then there's a synergy um, and we can just look at, I mean, right now we're, we're on Zoom and we have all these social media. Ten years ago, we didn't, there were like a handful of them, but I mean, most of us weren't even on, on Facebook ten years ago. And it has, has created a different kind of culture. And we just saw that in the American election. So, um, but, but to return to that sense of a different way of life, um, how, how fast can things change and how, what is that we need to understand in in relation to this as citizens? Yeah, Panilla. Well, I think we, we have to understand, uh, start, you know, looking at what kind of societies do we have today uh, from a data point of view. And uh, when you talk about the drones, I think China, uh, I call China a data di dictatorship where 
government uh, runs uh, citizens through data in many, many ways. It's like there are drones all over. And uh, the citizens accept it. Uh, it's really amazing they do. They don't accept it in Hong Kong, Hong Kong because they tasted the political freedom, but in China, there's not a lot of movement around this. Then we have the US, which is the opposite in my eyes is what I call, well, some people call it a surveillance a capitalistic society. You can call it a data monopoly. Here we have big, big, huge corporations running citizens or, or controlling citizens through data. And then we have the model, which I think we're working on in Europe and Canada, Japan, other countries are working in that direction as well, is where we actually should give humans control. Individuals should be in control of their own lives and not run neither by government nor by big corporations. And I think we need to understand what kind or discuss what kind of society do we want? Because I don't want China and I don't want the US. I mean, in the US, you see the difference between rich and poor. It is so scary how San Francisco has changed over the past 10 years. There's so many home, homeless, so many poor people. And I'd rather work for a society where we share our wealth in a better way, which we do a welfare system, which we have in the Nordic countries or in Northern Europe, I think. Um, so that's where I would start all of this. Uh, I don't think yeah, if, if we, where are we most threatened in the welfare societies, we're probably most threatened or most likely to go in the direction of China because we have governments who are really controlling uh, a lot of our data today. So it's very different from country to country and we're sitting in a very multinational, uh, uh, we are all from different countries right, right now. Right. So. Yeah, Penilla, you and I, we're both in Denmark, but Anders, you are in Sweden, Sweden, Sweden and Azim, you are in... I'm in whatever Britain will become after Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's been called Wangland, which is a combination of Wales and England, because Scotland will leave and uh, they'll forget about the Irish, so I'm in Wangland. <laughs> <laughs> is there a city that will remain the same or under the same name I where you are? And you know, cities cities are, I think, the um, cities are the constant thread, actually, uh, without creating a new thread for our discussion, um, because cities are so resilient. They survive plagues and earthquakes and nuclear bombs. It took 15 years for Hiroshima to, to economically recover. Of course, some of the, the uh, hereditary problems remained for a long time. And cities are incredibly resilient at times of change. So London will be London. It will be the 21st century version of London, not because it's special, but just because it's a city. But but if I can go back to this, uh, dis the discussion about the society, uh, then I think that compared to your talks about exponential, to me, exponential is fast, as fast as possible. I think we should do it as slow as possible in a way, because we need to have humans we have to go together. If we just go fast, like uh, with exponential technologies, um, we won't get humans. We, I, I think that the US elections show a really, really sad result of a, a, a country where technologies are actually destroying democracy and creating um, a split between people, which is really, really scary. And I think we should try and avoid that in Europe if we can. But knowledge is, is not helping democracy in the US. Anders? Well, um, I think you're right in the sense that biological change, evolution, we know is, is quite slow, uh, whereas this technology change is, is so rapid. So we, so we have to find some kind of balance here. Um, and. Um, I'm, I'm, um, I'm very scared about a, a situation where a few big tech companies and their experts on algorithms are in more and more control of what is going to happen. Um, we don't know how they design the algorithms. It's like black boxes to us. Uh, and it's interesting 
when we try to limit fake news or hate mails or hate um, speeches or whatever content, uh, the irony is that we, we ask the same tech companies to try to control it. And they do it by some kind of automation. And of course, with at least some interest or focus on their own commercial interests. So, so it's a very, very bizarre situation. We are asking those who provided the technology to control that same technology whenever there is problem because we don't have any mechanism for it. Um, there, was, there was at a time in the US an office for technology assessment. It was thrown out by the Republicans when Newt Gingrich was Speaker of the House in 1995. They never replaced it. Um, in the European Union, we have a small outfit called STOA, uh, which deals with technology, not assessments, but, but at least some kind of, of assessments. In Finland, we have something called CITRA. I happen to have been a member of their International Advisory Board, uh, which has a specific uh, assignment task from the Finnish parliament to help them understand technology development. So sort of a foresight body. But that's about it. Uh, so, so we need some kind of mechanism which can be neutral and which can follow developments and say, hello, stop, stop here. We have, we have to be more careful here. We have to have some policy frameworks that guide technology in the right direction. We don't have that. No, you, you know, I think it's very interesting to hear both uh, Pernil and um, Anders uh, on this. And, and Anders makes a point of Newt Gingrich in 1995. Um, and, and I think it's very important that we identify the, the root causes of the issues that, we're, that we, are, we are dealing with um, and we, we, we tackle them. So when we think about 1971, which is when the Intel 4004 processor, the first computer chip was published, uh, released. Um, uh, uh, an economist in America called Milton Friedman published uh, a, an, a le an, an editorial in the New York Times called the, um, the, the, the Purpose of the Corporation. And in that, he makes the argument that the only purpose of a company is to make money and return profits for its shareholders so long as it stays within the rules of the game. Now, that was the moment, the trigger moment for this long running battle in among Chicago economists around the rule, the, the nature of markets and the effectiveness of markets to govern outcomes in, in society. And in the US that started a moment of rapid deregulation, uh, which we copied aggressively in the, in the UK. And thankfully for those of you in the, in the Nordics and uh, Scandinavia, you didn't do it quite as aggressively. Um, but we, we took the, the brakes off the train of capitalism and capitalism innovation just at the time we delivered an, innov an exponential technology, which was the microchip. And, and so, so when I look back and say, where do these things actually find their, their starting point? Um, the technologies are the technologies and they, they develop in a particular way at a particular rate for very simple reasons to do with engineering and not to do with politics. But in, in the US and then the UK, we took, a, took out the state's role to moderate them. And there were two particular things I would draw attention to on this, uh, both of which relate to things that Anders and Panilla have said. Um, the first is that um, in, in 1980, when he took the presidency in the US, in 1981, when he made his inauguration speech, Ronald Reagan said, um, you know, the worst, the six worst words in the English language are, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. And he, he spent, and Margaret Thatcher did something similar in, in the UK and the US, started a movement of 30 years where we said, government is rubbish. If you want to do something well, do it in the market. And if the market can't do it, it's not worth doing and leave it to the state. And so we, we took out as part of economic orthodoxy, and it was nothing to do with Mark Zuckerberg, who I think is the most difficult CEO in the planet. It's nothing to do with the founders of Google or Apple. 
it, it started a, a long while a long while back. But the second thing that I would I would say is that, um, you know, back in nineteen in the early nineteen seventies, California start sorry the U.S. passed the first consumer privacy acts, and, um, but but m politics has a role to play in this. So for a long period of time in the United States, cable TV and uh, community radio had to be fair and balanced. And in the mid 1980s, as part of deregulation, the Federal Communications Commission said, you don't need to be fair and balanced. You can say whatever you like. And the polarization that gave rise to Newt Gingrich 1995, before the internet was mainstream, was driven by the act of deregulation that was instilled by the political orthodoxy of, of the time. In 2000, the US Congress was considering consumer privacy laws to be strengthened around data because of the emergence of the internet. And in 2001, um, because of the 9-11 tr uh, terrorist attack, people's interest became in tracking the data and the priority became national security, not consumer rights. And, and so I, I think there's a complicated picture pattern that has got us to where we've got to, where we have these deeply problematic companies deeply, deeply problematic companies creating this, this space. But the, 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 the key thing that I would draw attention to is that as societies, particularly in the US and the UK, we asked our governments, we told our governments to get out of the way from the, the behavior of these people. And then they behave badly and, and we're surprised. I mean, we shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> <Duh>. <laughs> Um, the, the the feeling that I that I get here from from hearing this is that we have I mean we have more or less created this monster this dragon this uh, creature that that keeps you know growing and growing and growing it's like it's it's eating everything and it's it's creating more of itself constantly and and here we are like little you know little tiny little sword saying uh uh what what can we do about this um, and and what we what we don't have are are the the appropriate institutions and uh, and the politicians to to create those institutions and the societies to you know have this conversation going I'm so happy that we're starting this conversation and having this conversation tonight um, but Anders you are you're the politician here how do we I mean you you get this how do we get your colleagues and the political systems to first of all get interested in this and to understand what is going on and then to think up uh, regulations and institutions that can handle this. First, let me see that I very much agree with Arsim that we have to look at the background at the history. And when the principle of shareholder value was becoming priority number one, and when the purpose of the company was to, uh, yeah, um, produce as much profits as possible. In a system, where we don't pay the full costs for production, leaving those costs to society to pick up. Of course, it cannot be sustainable. It's by definition unsustainable, the whole system. So we have to do something about that. When it comes to, and I see in the chat column that there are some questions are now, what is the role of building here? Well, I think we have to start with the policymakers. Uh, because if, we, if, if they don't understand that, that we have a challenge here and that we need to help each other to understand the challenge, we cannot expect them to organize any kind of education if they haven't even understood themselves what, what is at stake. But then when that happens, of course, we should, we should, we should use all possible means to engage citizens. And then, Lena, you have written a beautiful book, The Nordic Secret, which uh, describes how the Nordic countries 100 to 150 years ago, through a lot of organizations, building organizations at the, at, at the municipality level, at the rural level, really helped citizens to understand. And I don't think internet <laughs> is the proper tool here. I think you have to, you have to meet people yep. uh, physically. Uh, let's hope that the virus is gone soon so we can start meeting again physically because this, this is about uh, a deep uh, an understanding at a deeper level and, and it's about building trust because uh, unless we do that, I think trust in institutions like we now see in the US is going to evade very, very quickly. So a lot is at stake, but Asim uh, and Panila, I think 
those of us who come from the layman side, so to say, or at least are not uh, experts or, or, or developing algorithms, we, we should try to come together and, and do something about the political system. We have, we have, to, we have to throw a bomb in there and, mm -hmm. and, and so that something happens. But, but you also, I also really think that we cannot rely on only the politicians. Because if you look to Brussels now, we actually have some politicians who are really trying. I mean, Margaret Vestager and uh, Ursula von Leyen, I really think they, they got a lot of this. They under, understood a lot about the problems about monopolies and power, and they're trying to regulate. Uh, I, I don't think we regulate or enforce our laws well enough when it comes to data protection, but when it comes to monopolies, it's going pretty well. The problem is that those companies are so rich that they will they will not accept the 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 laws uh, and uh, they just pay their way out of it. So my my belief is that we really also need to engage companies, the good companies, <laughs> there are lots of them, and and citizens. And I have a lot of faith in companies um, who have a really good DNA, who are already working with social responsibility, they're working with the environment. They have now started working with data ethics. And uh, if they can help do the change, I have a lot of faith in them. Uh, I don't have that much faith in citizens because it's so hard changing their behavior. I mean, we are sitting here on Facebook, which I, I really, really, really don't like it. And I'm trying to get people away from We're Facebook. hypocrites. I know. I'm sorry. But it's, yes, I, I know. It's I almost said no to this only because of that. Uh, and I usually say no to it because of that, because I think it's wrong. And, uh, you know, for the fifth, uh, once a year, all the Danish politicians will have, will, each of them will have a, a uh, really good democratic speech and they will uh, transmit it live on Facebook. And it, it's really wrong. So we have to change behavior as well. And that's what I'm working a lot on. And I'm, I'm seeing a slow change. Uh, I'm seeing companies saying, no, 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 we're not using Zoom because we can't trust them. We're also on Zoom. I, I'm no, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, or, or they say, oh, we stop use uh, Google Analytics because uh, they actually steal our data and uh, tell everything about us to our um, competitors. And so there is an awakening amongst companies and uh, uh, conscious citizens, but it's there's a long way still. And of course, politicians also, but they can't do it alone. Right. Definitely. Vanilla, I would I would like to ask you two very uh, concrete uh, or, or ask you about two very concrete things, because I know that you are actually working with some of these companies and helping them, you know, figure out what would be the ethical way to create the product that we're creating. So I would love to hear something about that. And I would also love to hear something about the, the digital self-defense that you teach, because it's a very, I mean, that's very hands-on, but if, if we could just take a, a couple of examples from, from some of the companies, what is it that they're asking and what is it that, that, that they can do and, and you help them with? The problem of course is in Europe, we don't have a big home market so we can build uh, big technologies. I just realized that every single country in Europe has their own video platform as an alternative to Zoom. So we don't have one big European Zoom, which we could use, which would live up to our laws and pay the taxes in Europe and all the things I would like a company to do. So the tech, the building of new startups, that's probably where we have to go uh, and, and see a change. But the big corporations I work with, for example, uh, IKEA, they're not a data company, they're not a tech company, but they use a lot of data and they have a lot of power. So when big corporations say, well, we won't, don't advertise here or there, that's also trying to make a change. And if they say, Novo Nordisk say, we won't use Zoom, that's the first step. And they're working on principles of data ethics, which are very, very um, aligned with the Asilomar uh, principles. The, the, the EU high level expert group on AI, they, they did a whole list of how to use AI in an ethical way. And that's very aligned with the Asilomar principles. 
So we are seeing a change in companies. Um, I don't believe we'll change Facebook. I don't believe we'll change Google because that's a core business model. But we can see, for example, in Microsoft and in Apple, even though they have a lot of problems as well, but there are some big tech companies who are behaving well when it comes to privacy. Uh, so I see a change here, um, but it's slow, especially from an individual human point of view. It, it's, uh, Lena, isn't one of the problems that many of the services that are provided are very convenient? Yeah, and it, I mean, and we love being, them. And we like being, them. being on Zoom right now, it's like, yeah. uh, we figured out how it works, and so we stick with it. Um, yeah. So, so and... I mean, we, it, that, that is probably the problem, that, that we, we have so much convenience and comfort yeah. through and, these and it's, companies. And it's free, and we've become yeah. the, uh, the product. Panel, I would like to change, but look at the, in, uh, the climate or the green revolution. It also costs something to go green and eat uh, organic vegetables. It is, uh, I mean, the majority will still eat non-organic vegetables because it's much cheaper, but, but it, it comes with a price. Of course it does. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to avoid Google search engine because I have some other really good search engines and I can give you all the tools. And some people are changing, but it's maybe one in a thousand or one in 5,000. Uh, I know convenience is still king, but uh, I also think that the behavior we ha have within food, for example, buy local, that's a trend we'll see in Europe and we're seeing it coming out of Brussels. We have to try and build our own data infrastructure, for example. So, so because the US and China are very protective, protectionistic, we are seeing that coming out of Europe right now. So I think we will think more go local also when we are buying and using uh, digital services in the future. And yes, somebody said Spotify is European, but di didn't the US buy Spotify? I think so. But it was originally Swedish and European, but it was built like an American so-called free, uh, on a free business model, right? So it used all the same tools to become big. And I don't know if Spotify is better than any of the others when it comes to treating our data. Somebody says here that uh, yeah, he pays, pays for Spotify. For Spotify. It, it's um, less than 10% of the users of Spotify who pay, isn't it, Marco? And uh, it, it's not money that goes to the musicians. 0% of, um, of uh, listeners to commercial radio pay, right? Because it's all ad supported. Um, uh, is it still Swedish owned mainly? That's good. I'm really happy about that. Uh, but I mean, across the world, right? I mean, across the world, commercial radio is at, is advertising su supported. I mean, it's di it is different in a um, in some of the internet contexts. I mean, I think the the question is is um, you know you touch on some really important questions about. Um, the nature of rights and the nature of rights that citizens have and how we we get those rights um, and, and what kind of obligations get created. And I think one of the things that we um, we as a and I don't I don't quite agree with Anders that this is about the politicians, because it was after all the politicians who put GDPR in place. It wasn't the citizens. It was the policy politicians who put the European Privacy Directive in pl place. Um, that they it is the politicians who've put in uh, laws around genomic technology and genetic engineering, so they have they have done done all of these things, and and I do think that the problem that we deal with is a very knotty one that needs um, knotty by knotty sorry lots of languages here I I mean complicated, um, it, it requires um, many many interventions. Uh, if you imagine Swiss cheese, the cheese with the holes in it. If you have just one layer of cheese between you and a bad person, there's always a hole to get through. If you layer lots of layers of cheese together, you'll block out the light. And we have to choose many different interventions um, in order to uh, figure out how we get to a more virtuous and diligent and dignified relationship, set of relationships in the world that we're in. Um, and, and, I, and I think that there are a couple of things that, that spring to mind. One is, you know, I, 
w one is that whenever there are um, new possibilities, new rights need to be created and new rights come with them, new obligations. Um, and, and I think that we are as citizens lacking many of the new rights relative not just to big companies, uh, but also relative to the government that we ought to we ought to have. And I'll give you an example that happened in the UK. So we created um, test and trace, which is this idea that if you've been exposed to somebody um, who may have COVID, uh, you have to isolate and you'll get an alert. And of course, within two weeks of this thing launching, it turned out that the police were going to get access to the test and trace data. Now, <clears throat> that's a problem because you've, crea you, you've created a new potential for the government and frankly, public health is the government's responsibility. And yet you've not created new rights for the citizen, which is to say, this is for public health, this is not for criminality. And, and I think about, and I'm curious about what happened with Swish in, in Sweden, right? Because Swish has created a digital audit trail for anyone who buys a little bit of marijuana in Sweden, not that anyone would. Um, and how are rights now protected for citizens if they're using that digital currency in, in Sweden? But, but the second point I want to make is, is that I talked about the Swiss cheese model, which is a model from um, a sociologist called James Reason, is that as citizens, we also have obligations. You know, we got the right to vote when we could ask for that right to vote and when we could read the ballot paper and when we could understand. So, so we had to do certain things in order to get that, in order to shake off the shackles of the kings and the queens. And if you look at some countries that have done really well in the digital transition, despite difficult scenarios, what they have is a digital hygiene. They've applied the process of ongoing learning to build up their digital competency, the digital self-defense that Penilla talks about. And I think about Estonia that lives under the shadow of, the, of Russia, a third of its population um, ethnically Russian, the Russians attacking them constantly through cyber threats and info war. And yet Estonia manages a democracy with e-voting. It manages to produce five multi-billion dollar global technology companies out of this tiny population. It's the size of Stockholm on a hot summer's day. And the other countries to look at is Taiwan, which lives under the shadow of a Chinese threat that has only been a democracy for 25 years, 24 years, and has a deep, deep di digital engagement by its citizens. As a consequence of that high level of trust, dealt with COVID extremely well. And as a consequence of that high level of trust, deals with misinformation from Facebook without the government having to step in and threaten Facebook. So I think that there, there are a few things where we can construct the, um, uh, we can construct the obligations of the citizen as well. And that's why I'm pretty excited by the work that you do, Penila, which is to go into the citizen and say, here's how you equip yourself to live in this world. So Penila, perhaps you can tell us what it is that you do. What, what is that digital self-defense that you teach people? Well, uh, it it's first of all, understanding the role of data in the society, both as in the society model, but also in the business model. Understanding that data is the new um, blood in our veins, in our society. So understanding that, and especially the business model of free, uh, first fix is free. People really need to understand that uh, in details. And I, I, I explain that, uh, with lots of examples. And then it is about, okay, you can actually choose uh, tools which, which are not tracking you. you can, uh, uh, most of the tools I'm using are not tracking me. I've decided I'm using Apple and I'm pretty happy I can afford using Apple because here they, do, they don't live from my data. Um, they live from selling me a computer. Um, so I point to a lot of different tools they can use and help them install them. Um, a couple of years ago, it was, for example, installing an ad blogger. 
You only need to install that when you use Chrome today, which you probably use most of you sitting around here, uh, because uh, over 90% of the population in Europe or the world are using Chrome, the Chrome browser. Uh, but I would use the Safari browser or the Firefox browser because they block the third party cookies by default. So they don't gossip about me to thousands of other companies about what I'm looking at at the internet. So, so in schools, it's really unfortunate because Google is actually um, entering all the schools now in Denmark and a lot of other countries. They're taking over the market share of um, Microsoft in schools. Uh, so it's very hard to teach schools not to use Google stuff because they, they're buying it and they get the computers, but... And they get it for free. And yeah, they get it very cheap, cheaper than Microsoft. Um, so, so instead of using Messenger or WhatsApp from, from, um, from um, Facebook, I would tell them to use uh, Signal or Telegram or Wire, which is a European uh, app, which is really cool, a chat app. And nobody is listening in on you. I never get ads for, about what I've been talking about. Every time I teach, or most people believe that tech companies are listening in on your conversation on the phone. I don't think they are, but thousands of people have experience with it. Oh, I discuss this with my boyfriend and suddenly I get an ad. I never get that because I don't use these tools like the Messenger app. Um, so I think it's both egoistically, you have to take care of your own digital reputation and your Google CV, which I teach, you know, I fake it on Facebook and Instagram. I don't use my own name on, on platforms I don't trust and I don't use professionally. So I teach them to understand how to be a, a public person because everything on social media is public even though Facebook say you can be private in here. So it's stuff like that, you know? So, so when you Google me, because everybody's Googling, right? Then the first page, one, two, three, four, five on my name will be more or less what I have told Google to show because I want to be in control of what you're seeing about me. Uh, and I think that's very important for young people because they won't get a job. Uh, everybody's Googling everybody before they hire anybody, right? So they have to be in control of their Google CV. So it's stuff like that. Yeah. Can, can I, but I want to put the, the other side to this, right? Which is that, um, you know, we, we've seen a, a dramatic rise in, um, in this, this theory of meritocracy. Um, that if you work hard enough, you can achieve some social mobility. Uh, and through that social mobility, um, you can get a better life. And that's been played out. And it, you've seen in the UK and the US, which are the two countries I know best, increasing enrollments in universities. And it's constructed a, a false cred credentialism, um, which means that those who have the credentials get the great jobs, regardless of their capabilities. And certainly, you know, in, in, in the UK and the US, which is nearly 400 million people, um, you, the, it's people from wealthier backgrounds who get those better degrees. Um, and, and one of the things that the internet allows us to do is it allows people to, in, in public, demonstrate their capability. So mm. if you're a software developer, you can write your software on GitHub, you can make it available, people can see your code, they can see what you actually do. If you're a copywriter, you can keep a trail of great essays you've written on your blogging platform that gets indexed by Google. If you're a photographer or creative in any way, you can live on Instagram. And I think what, what, one of the things that we need to be, I think we need to, when we think about how we fix this and how we improve things, we do need to recognize that these technologies, whether they're built by Instagram or somebody else, are not going to go away. People like them. 600 million people a, a month are not compelled to use Instagram yet still use Instagram. Um, and, and so how do we, the, the challenge I think is how do we create an environment that allows people to use these things in a way that allows them to maintain their agency and their dignity. And, and, I, and I choose that idea of credentialism and meritocracy because I think it's an incredible flattener in the world to be able to expose 
courses globally, to be able to find talent globally, and to finally force people, especially employers, to make a decision on the quality of what someone does, not their ability to get to a university that their parents could pay for. And, and I, th I, th I think we have to be, we have to find a way of navigating through, through these conflicting yeah. aspects. But all these people you're talking about who, who get to these universities and who manage their digital, digital reputation very well, they keep away the private stuff. And of course you can use Instagram if you want. What I think most people should think about is stay the, the stuff you consider private. If some, some gay people want to tell the whole world they're gay, that's fine with, with me. You decide what's private for you and then keep that away and use platforms which, which are truly private and then maintain your reputation without lying, of course. Uh, I'm not in, 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 in my business to help Facebook uh, gain more money uh, because we have to be to so honest and tell all the good and bad stuff about ourselves. I'm in the business to help individuals and I'm okay with the fact that they they shouldn't lie about themselves, of course not, but they, it's okay that they polish their uh, digital reputation. And we have to help the less resourceful doing this because the very resourceful can do it and they already do it. And exactly, because I mean, some of us, uh, whether we did get a good education or not, understand these technologies and you know, understand that, that you don't share everything. And if you do, be careful how you share it. But there is... But there's also the pattern in that which we share. And, and so very few people are aware of that because it's not just whether I show pictures of, of my family members or the parties that I went to or so forth. It's also about how often do I do it? Uh, who are the people that I'm with who are also sharing or who are not sharing what I'm sharing? I mean, there are all these hidden structures behind our own behaviors that we may not be aware of that algorithms can find and that are actually... Uh, maybe but the, the, the real product that you're just talking about what you can control yourself right I mean, if you like specific brands on facebook they can analyze that you are a lesbian who uh, all this stuff who's you know, pregnant and uh, yeah. about to break up with your girlfriend That's yes so. guy, yeah. marco asked me do you think that common people can be educated to have such awareness yes i think and i love teaching kids much more than school teachers because kids, what they need to learn is what is privacy? Why is it necessary that you control who knows what about you when? That's what kids need. They understand. Actually, they manipulate with their own data today because on Snapchat, you have Snap Maps, for example. They know exactly when to turn it off so friends or family cannot see where they are. So they are already navigating with data. What they need in, to understand is why it's so, what, what is a democracy? What is privacy? Why do we need these things? Um, and then I think they will learn. I, it will be different in 10 years. And, and from what age, what age groups uh, are you teaching? And, and, and Everybody, but mainly from 11, 12 and up. And the 12 year olds are actually the best ones because they still listen, you know, when you, when you turn 15, you think you know everything. <laughs> I, I think this is a fascinating and, and very important part of the challenge, but we, I think, should spend some time on, on other parts of the challenge because the economy is more or less being turned upside down. The employment or job market is being turned upside down. And we have very little preparedness for that. So that's why I'm a bit critical about policymakers. Maybe they, they were relatively quick in, 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 in addressing the privacy and data issues in the European context. But on all these other issues, I see very little action. And education is, of course, part of it, because we must help people to be educated for, for the new economy, uh, trained for the new economy. I'm also very much concerned about the machine human interface, uh, which is not uh, something that most people are exposed to, but, but it's happening. And where the hell will it lead to? Perhaps as you another just, ethical you could, issue. So, so there are so many things here. Right, Azim, uh, or could be any of you, but how far 
is technology with regards to uh, uh, machine brain interface? You know, we are, um, we're, we're making, uh, I mean, we, not me, but as uh, sort of technologists are making steady progress. Um, but we always live uh, in tandem with our technologies and our technologies change, change us uh, in, in particular ways. And uh, it, it's just that we've had thousands of years, sometimes or hundreds of years to adapt to that, to that change. Um, I, I don't know how many of us would imagine going a day the way my great, great grandfather would have done without paper or pen. Uh, for a day or for a week. I mean, we, we would have considered it or for, without light after sunset, which he would have done in living in what is now Pakistan 150 years ago. Um, so, so technology does change, changes us and there is, a, there is a, an unavoidability about the fact that we will explore some of these dimensions. But I think what's not avoidable is how we shape it and how we actively engage and when we choose to engage. So, so both Anders and Panila Peniel, um, talked about the problem of um, you know, taxation in this new economy and where do people pay their taxes? And, and the thing that we have to understand about companies like Facebook or Amazon or, uh, and so on is that by and large, with a couple of small exceptions, and Apple was hit by a fine a couple of years ago, they pay their taxes and they pay them fully legally by the rules that our democratic governments put in place. And the problem there, therefore, is not, I mean, I don't know if any one of us has ever paid more of our taxes than we have legally been obliged. Uh, and so there's a, there's a famous parable from the Bible, which is um, uh, G, uh, G, Jesus says, um, let those of you who don't have a, a, a fleck in your eye remove you know from the other or a, a, the, the moat in the other's eye or let of those of you who are without sin cast the first stone right was the was a correct one and and i think that, 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 that this is the observation here is that over the last 40 years it has been in the interests of of governments to not tackle the problem the emergent problem of where should taxation fall I mean, the reason Apple and Facebook and Google are all headquartered in Ireland is because the Irish government offers them 10% taxation rates. If the Irish government offered them 40%, they would not be there. They would have gone and settled up in Stockholm or Copenhagen, which are both beautiful cities. And I think, I think the, 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 the thing that we have to tackle here is that we have not kept up with the transformation of the economy for, for whatever reason that is. And now I, I side with Anders and I say the politicians have not kept up with it because the first companies to start to play this taxation game were actually in physical products because they were the ones who had the brands. And they said, you're gonna sell my physical product at, in, in the UK and I'm a brand and I don't, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna charge you as a, as a, as a famous, Scandinavian furniture brand, a very high license to use my yellow and blue logo. I, and, and, and that company will be headquartered in the Netherlands, which has very low tax rates. And so, you know, IKEA in, or the uh, Ingvar group uh, it, it engages in the same activities, that similar activities to Facebook and Google. Pepsi does the same. Procter & Gamble does the same. The banks do the same. It is a function of the way in which we fell prey to the promise of, of unbridled capitalism as a way of improving the human condition. And, and now we sit with these incredibly powerful companies with their AI engines learning all the time, creating a, a, a weakening of the tax base. And, and we can go off and get an extra 20 billion from Facebook. It won't barely changes their profitability and it makes no difference to our societies. The issue has got to go deeper than that, which is how do we actually recognize that in a digital driven economy, taxation needs to look really, really different. And, and you know, Anders, Anders and his peers, the politicians have to wise up to it. And Panilla has to go off and teach every citizen that when they go to the ballot box, they need to make sure that this is, is something they care about. 
I think we need more teachers than than Pernilla on this. I also think we need some questions from the from the chat. And uh, I know that Isley has been keeping an eye on the on the chat and the questions and comments. So Ashley, what do we have there? And you need to turn on your microphone. Yes, yeah. yeah. So to go back a little bit in the chat, there was one um, interesting conversation starting on like the, I, I, how digital technology can also be used in a very ideal way when it comes to forming the um, politics or shaping politics. And we've been talking about how there's this gap between uh, policymakers on the one hand and the tech technological developers on the other. Um, and the question I think maybe to Anders first would be, uh, do you also see a potential in technologies for uh, democratizing or decentralizing the entire policymaking process and thereby bridging this gap? Uh, absolutely. And there are have been fascinating experiments at, at, at regional and municipality levels in parts of the world. So I, I think that that is, of course, perfectly doable. And as always, I mean, we have we have uh, governance challenges uh, and we also have a lot of options in the governance area with these technologies. So I, I'm, I'm all for that. Absolutely. Um, and you can have so-called direct democracy in, in, a, in a very convincing way. I mean, the, the Swiss system with the referendum uh, is being looked upon as, as, a, as a bit odd, but in fact, it gives the population direct control, you could say, over many sensitive issues. Uh, and with the use of technology, you could, of course, uh, make that happen quite often. And uh, I, I think that that could be a, a step in the right direction. Absolutely. But yep. you would have to deal with, <laughs> with, with security and safety, of course. So that it's not manipulated. Right. Do we have any any other good questions? I saw one from Med at some point uh, in the chat. Um. Yeah. So maybe uh, I mean, if so, we are here also at the uh, European Bildung Fireside Chat. Um, so it would also be good to focus on what the role of building can be in this entire process. And we've been talking about it a little bit, but the question now would be how far can we go? How much room is there still for, for us citizens to, to learn more about these technologies and to use these technologies and, and where will this lead us? Um, and maybe that's a question to you, Azim. I mean, I think the, we have to accept that um, technology is, is part of the human condition and the, the human condition shapes it and it gets shaped by the, the technology. Um, we, one of the reasons why we end up where we are is because we said that technology was a realm of other people rather than us ourselves. Um, and I think in order to really make a difference to the nature of people's lives, we have to bring this closer to where we live our lives. I mean, we don't live our lives in the abstract of global platforms. We live our lives in the day-to-day -day of our hallways and our stairs and our kitchens. Uh, and, and so how can we give people back the the opportunity to investigate that technology and tinker with that technology. I come from an age where you could, I've got my first computer here. <laughs> 1981. Wow. 1K, 16 kilobytes of RAM in this, in this pack, where we, we tinkered with it and we made it do the things that we wanted it to do. Now, how can we establish that and recreate that while also recognizing that technology is now infrastructural? So in the same way that no one expects me to be able to tinker with the gas pipe, putting methane gas into my boiler and my, my- Yeah, my... please don't. No, I won't do that. <laughs> there are aspects of the technology that, that should not be tinkered with. And anyone who's owned an Apple phone knows for all the privacy benefits you get, you can't tinker with it, but there are new, elements that we should be able to control locally and experiment with 
locally. Um, so while I'm not particularly excited, I think it's important, the right to repair movement that the EU is pushing, this idea that you should have a right to repair your technology rather than retire it. I also think it's important that we find ways of allowing this idea that comes from politics called subsidiarity, which is that the decisions should be made by the people who are affected by them as close to the point at which they are being going to be effective. How and much education would we need, you know, throughout society in order for that to work? Because, I mean, these technologies, you, you show this, you know, 1981 computer, which was really, really simple and could do really, really simple stuff. And as you said, don't don't tinker with the gas pipe. So now it's like, don't tinker with my Wi-Fi. I mean, I can turn it on and off and that's about it. I, I really have no knowledge about what goes on inside it. Uh, you can't even buy a car and understand what goes on in the engine because it's it's all digital. So, I mean, we have we've lost some of our influence on our own stuff. And just one concrete example, I bought a, a, a Kindle some years back and uh, I was out traveling and I saw in the online newspaper that if I didn't update the, the Kindle before a certain date, it wouldn't work anymore. And so I was traveling, I didn't get back before that date. And one of the first things, or at least the third or fourth thing that I did when I got back home was plug it in and try to turn it on. And sure enough, it didn't work. And this was not a piece of equipment that I rented from somebody. I actually owned it. I had a piece of paper saying that you own this thing. But somebody just switched it off from afar, and I have no idea who they who they are. Um, so there, I mean, we've lost power over physical stuff. And what kind of education, what kind of where should we meet and, and learn about this? Who should provide the knowledge for us? I mean, could we put a, an education tax on, on the big platforms and say, if you want to be in our market, you also have to provide the education for it or- No thanks. No thanks? So should I mean, they provide the education for the competitor? Do you want uh, Google or Facebook to teach you how to take control of your data? No way. I mean, uh, I think Anders said uh, about Finland, uh, they have a really good program where they teach citizens in a AI. It's that could be a role model for lots of other countries. We talked about Estonia, that's a role model in many of the ways they do. That could be a role model. I think we have to point to all the positive small examples out there and try and copy those and work much closer together. And then Marco um, is asking a really important question for the second time. And that is, can we turn the whole model around so you as a citizen are paid to use your data? And there are lots of startups all around uh, Europe and the US trying to do this. Um, I'm not sure you can actually get paid for your data. I don't like that model. It's more or less like getting paid for a kidney. <laughs> but <laughs> I do believe that you can actually gain a lot from your data and we'll see that in the future where you will want to get all your location data from your telco and put it into a service so you could calculate a better route to work when you bike or whatever or, or data about your health so you can activate your own data. Uh, but it will be hard to educate uh, middle-aged people today about that. I think it will be the younger generation. But maybe, I mean, it could be a model to think about that you get money out of your own data. Uh, if that, I don't like it actually, but um, is, a lot of is, companies are trying. Isn't this whole issue of education partly a generational problem? Uh, yes. Because when I look at my grandchildren, they are so, so much more fluent and able than I ever will have become. So, so of course, there is, a, but, but that doesn't mean it's not a problem. It's not a challenge. But that's at the individual level. I'm also thinking yeah. about at the societal level, because it, one thing is that I understand what to share and what not to share and what platform to use and which not. But, but I mean, the, the infrastructure, the power structure in society, and uh, I mean, one of the first things that Azim said was, uh, this is not inevitable. I mean, we're not pre predestined to live with these technologies in a certain way if we 
choose otherwise. But the, the problem is, do we choose otherwise? And how do we get the knowledge and insight and mobilize and, and empowerment to change this path? Because there is, I mean, the, the exponentiality of this is sort of its own engine. And how do we, how do we turn it in a, in a different direction? Uh, how do we get to that point where we do take charge? Just, just, just so you know that, for example, in Denmark, and I'm sure it's the same in other countries, there's a new uh, topic entering the, 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 the basic schools called technology understanding. And it's a free year pilot project which will be uh, embedded totally in the schools. So I think the government and the, the, the state has a big role here, just like in Finland. Mm. Um, that sounds very good. May I, may I give you one example? In most areas, technology is just uh, evolving. Uh, and all of a sudden, you have new stuff on the market. Uh, my neighbor in, in Stockholm, Jan Carlson, he is uh, CEO of Vioneer, who is the leading company when it comes to uh, autonomous driving, all the sensors, etc. cetera. And, and I asked him a couple of months ago, when will this happen? Because you have been talking about this for so long. He said, it will only happen when we can guarantee more or less 100% safety, because this technology will not be allowed in cities unless it's absolutely safe. Even if it's already today safer than when, 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 when humans drive. Now, this is an example where a, a new technology is very obvious to us. We know about it, we talk about it, but most of the other stuff is just happening. And Asim, I would like to ask you, because you are, you are trying to help us through your newsletter, to mm-hmm. become aware of all this stuff. How, how can we organize that? I mean, one thing is to, to, have a, to have an educational program for citizens like in Finland and Estonia, great. But, but how can we, I, I, I'm, I'm looking after this sort of technology assessment mechanism. Mm. I, I mean, I th- I, one of the area where I'm, um, I'm optimistic is that uh, five years ago, the level of debate around these issues was uh, very thin um, and the number of people who were active in trying to come up with ways of tackling it was very, very small. So we can look at one particular issue, which is um, the question of whether AI systems are built ethically. Uh, and in the last five years, hundreds of researchers have uh, become very, very active in, in this area and they've secured concessions from the technology companies, from the technology that gets built. They haven't changed the business model, but for example, um, it was Google, um, uh, Google's ethical AI team, which has done breakthrough work on checking ha- whether algorithms have racial, gender, and other types of intersex mm. bias in them. So there's been, a, there's, been pro- there's been progress, but I think of this as um, a grand societal challenge because it needs action at so many levels. We've talked about the citizen and we've talked about the politician. Um, At these moments where political institutions maybe don't have all the answers, I think business leaders also have an important role to to play. Mm -hmm. Now, part of the problem with business leaders is that we can't really uh, unfortunately rely on them. So uh, a couple of, at the start of last year or the, the start of this year perhaps, the, um, a large number of American companies at the business roundtable, these are some of the biggest non-technology companies in America, signed up to um, the idea that we need to put shareholder value, lower down our priorities and think about stakeholder value. Now for the, the three of you in Northern Europe, of course, this is the nat- natural state that you find yourselves in, but it's not the state in, in the US or the UK. So they went off and signed up to this. Nine months later, this is, they actually did it in 2019, They've done nothing, even before COVID, no, nothing. No. Because it was easier to send a press release and they don't get held to account. So we have to find ways of held, having them be held to account because the problem is very big and it's not a, um, it's not something for which there is a, a si- single solution. Mm. Um, Here comes a are... long question. Look, yeah. at, look in the chat box. 
Um, we're also heading towards the end of our conversation, but if Anders, you saw one last question there from the- No, uh, it's, it, the chat. it's too long for me to, to read. You have to- <laughs> <laughs> Then I'll ask you another question, which is, is a long question also, but I'll ask it to all uh, three of you, which is, um, where would you like that we took our civilization with these technologies? What would be the positive scenario? And Asim, you get to start. Okay. So I think um, the, the positive scenario is um, uh, has four characteristics. Um, so the characteristic number one is um, a characteristic of resilience um, at, at all levels and in all sen senses of the word, individual resilience, uh, community resilience, national resilience to the types of shocks and surprises we'll see during the exponential age, pandemics, climate change, cyber threats. Um, the second is, is intelligence. Um, we are constructing machines that have very low levels amount of intelligence, uh, but there will be lots of those machines. And so can we harness those the way that we harness the electric motor to improve the human condition? The third is sustainability. We haven't talked about this much, but when you have this group, it's obviously a critical part, which is, even though these technologies allow us to produce things without having to rely on fossil fuels or environmental degradation, they're much more efficient. Um, that doesn't prevent us over consuming. So we still need to change the value systems in order to establish a sense of sustainability. And I think the third thing is that, you know, at moments of very rapid change, some people are, are, comfortable with it and others become very uncomfortable with it and they become defensive and aggressive and difficult particularly in their politics and so I think we need to have a, a large amount of empathy in a society that is changing very very rapidly so I, I think of this as being an R, an R, an I, an S and an E a way of rise of rising into uh, this uh, this new world. Ironically, I, I, when I look at my computer, I see that I just received an email from Peter Diamandis at Singularity <laughs> University. It's sort of ironic. Is, is he watching? I, I don't know. But um, I, I can very much agree with what Asim said. I, I think, I hope these technologies can help us move in the direction of an economy which is focusing on well being and not only production growth, which has been. The, the, the main objective. This, this focus on GDP growth is so primitive and it was never meant to be a welfare or well-being indicator, but it has become. Um, and, and that's why we are in this shit now. So we have, we, have to, we have to move to another sort of mindset. What is important in life? It's quality of life, it's well-being. And then I hope that we can also make have some matchmaking between scientists who are busy working on sustainability challenges, including climate change, biodiversity loss, etc., and some of these guys who deal with the algorithms so that they understand each other because they don't do that today. They don't talk to each other. Uh, experts on algorithms, they are not experts on climate change and vice versa. So we need to, we need to cross fertilize here. And I, that, I see that has to be fast topic for another uh, fireside chat. We'll, uh, we'll figure out who these uh, people should be. Um, and we should also make one on, on the economy. That would be really cool. Penilla, uh, where should our civilization be heading with this? I totally agree with Anders on the, the GDP question. We really need to change our success parameters in our societies to include uh, well, human well-being. And I also think we need to define what is a human being. What is a human being and how do we want to keep that human being at the center? We cannot allow machines to take over. We need machines to be cobots and help us and assist us. Uh, we should not laugh about them, which we do today, <laughs> but uh, we should not, which is really crazy because maybe they will laugh of us. <laughs> but we should, we should define what is a human being because uh, I don't know if you read, of course, you read Homo Deus, uh, uh, Harari's mm. book, and I, I love that. Uh, it's scary, but he says that um, 
he talks about this new kind of uh, superhumans, which which are transhumanists who will embed technology in their body and uh, their brain and 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 he says I just hope that these superhumans, this new race of humans, they will treat us humans as well as we have treated animals. <laughs> That's irony, of course, but no, um, we need to put humans in the center and what kind of humans and what are our values, you know, values is also, we have to agree on that. We can't do that on a global level. I, I don't think so anymore. Human rights are universal, but a lot of countries don't give a shit about it. So maybe, we to, maybe, maybe we can hope for some change if Trump goes because he has yeah. been so detrimental, so oh, detrimental. I agree, I agree. And on that note, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, talking about, I mean, we're, I mean, <laughs> thank you, Penelo, for bringing up the animals. I mean, we just uh, killed 15 million mink in Denmark. So <laughs> it's, it's a really horrible, it's a really horrible day to bring this up. And I would like to invite all our, all our guests to, to turn on their camera and come in and uh, share a toast for um, humans, uh, humanity, human rights, ethics, uh, the way that we use technologies, um, our future for Europe and uh, for the rest of the globe. And uh, I would like to thank you for a wonderful uh, Thursday evening. I had a good time. I hope that everybody else did as well. Uh, thanks to uh, Azim and Anders and Penilla and to the rest of you. Ashley, thank you for uh, having, uh, keeping an eye on the, um, on the chat. And uh, we'll be back in two weeks on November 26th. And we will uh, hear about what goes on in Belarus, in Ukraine, and in the Balkans. And um, I'm looking very much forward to that. So I hope to see you again soon. And um, those of us who are on Zoom, continue afterwards. And uh, cheers to the rest of you. And thank you for a good evening. Cheers. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.